Well, thank you very much, and uh, not, not just for having me here, but uh, for your commitment for your work. Uh, you know, I know of your organization and its record, its history, the things that it stands for, and anyone who would associate with it uh, automatically has my respect uh, and my solidarity and commitment to do anything that I can in order to help your efforts. I also want to extend a special thanks to, to my brother uh, for your genius. Uh, you know, I uh, you know, feel everything that you said. Uh, the only place where we part company is that I, I do want a podium. Uh, <laughs> The reason is many times I say things that get the audience kind of angry and I want some place to hide. <laughs> <laughs> so I need my photo. Uh, you know, I uh, very often, you know, people always say that uh, when I speak, I tend to deal with history. And uh, that's for a reason. I uh, compare the efforts to try and fix anything, uh, especially a, a problem, a political, social, or economic problem. <laughs> Uh, with trying to fix a car. Okay, if you have never taken a car apart, if you don't know how the car was manufactured, if you don't know anything about cars, and you have a car that's not functioning, you're not going to fix that car. All right? You have to understand the mechanics of it. You have to understand the origins of it. And there's no difference when we talk about the relationship between law enforcement and communities of color. If you don't understand the origins of it, there's no way that you can hope to fix it. Right. And so one of the things that uh, we have to do is we have to go back to the beginning. And we have to understand that this problem is one that has its genesis during the slave era. Right. Because one of the things that many people don't understand, because their impressions of slavery are based on what they've seen in Gone with the Wind, <laughs> is that what was happening on the plantation was not the popular notion of happy darkies in the cotton fields singing spirituals, trying to shut their work, and trying to get out from under a master's watchful gaze, but all the time really loving the master who sits on his veranda sipping a mint julep in his white suit and doing good things for his servants. It was not that way. And because many people who are descended from these people believe that that's what slavery was about, many of them, inappropriately, are ashamed of their ancestors because they say these people didn't fight back. If you read a book called Runaway Slaves written by John Hope Franklin, he performs a great service for all of us because what he did is he went back and he took contemporaneous writings from that era, journals, diaries, newspaper articles, wanted ads and wanted posters, and instead of providing a narrative of what those things says, he gives you the actual text. And what emerges from that portrait that he presents of what was happening during that era is of an enslaved population that was at war against its oppressors. At every opportunity, these people were putting poison in the master's school, or they were running away, or they were breaking up the farm equipment, or they were burning the crops. And if they could get Master off by himself, they'd cut off Master's head. I mean, this was intense resistance. And it terrorized those who held them in bondage. I mean, it terrified them. In fact, they couldn't sleep at night because they didn't know if these people were not going to come in from the fields and set the house on fire. And for that reason, they invented many different and unbelievable tortures that were used against these people in order to hold them in a condition of servitude. But in addition to that, they also enacted a series of laws that were called slave codes. These laws placed severe restrictions on what enslaved Africans could do. They couldn't learn to read. They couldn't congregate in groups of more than two or three. They couldn't go from place to place off the plantation unless they had a particular type of a pass. They couldn't be instructed in the use of weapons. They couldn't possess a weapon. Uh, they couldn't learn any of the things that could be used for purposes of insurrection and rebellion. In fact, they wouldn't even let enslaved Africans use drums because they believed that drums were used for purposes of communication in Africa, and they didn't want them communicating and coordinating insurrections and rebellions. And so there were, as part of the process of enforcing these slave codes, the establishment of what were called slave patrols. 
These were people who were deputized to monitor the movements of enslaved Africans, to chase down runaways, and to otherwise keep these people under control. These are the ancestors of the police. There was no such thing as police as we know it before the slave patrols. These groups evolved into the police. So from the very beginning, the purpose of the police was to control and to oppress and to contain Africans. When we understand this, it explains a great deal. And what we also understand is that the use of slave patrols extended even beyond slaveholding territories. Because with the introduction of the Fugitive Slave Act, which allowed masters to chase down their escaped slaves even into the northern free territories, you found people who were roaming the streets in the north and in other free regions who were functioning as slave patrols, whose job it was was to essentially racially profile people and to stop and detain people who looked like they might be escaped runaways. So they would stop them, they would ask them who they are, they'd ask for their credentials, they would check them out. So even if you were a genuine and honest to goodness freedman, you had your genuine freedom as an, as an African, and you were walking down the street in Boston, New York, any place, you could be stopped by these patrols and ask who you are, where you going, are you really free? This all sounds very familiar. And it is something that has continued as part of law enforcement culture even up to today. But along with this whole process of patrolling Africans began a process of what we refer to as the criminalization of Africans. Because at the time that Africans began to move, to migrate out of slave territories and into the north, and they began to establish themselves as free people, and to build communities and to establish themselves, they also began to do something else, and that was they began to compete for jobs and for economic opportunities with white workers. This created great disruption and confusion and alarm among those who were not accustomed to having people competing with them for anything. And so what emerged out of that was an organization called the American Colonization Society. The purpose of the American Colonization Society was to take people who were of African descent and to transport them out of the country and back to Africa where they belong. So this was a, 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 an enterprise that was their, their, their primary mission. And so to the extent that that mission ran into resistance as they began to try and sell the idea, they found the need to find a justification for their program. And what they created was the idea that African people were criminal by nature. And so they began to publish lots of propaganda about the criminal nature and tendencies of those who were Africans. Uh, they came up with all kinds of pseudo-scientific uh, writings and evidence of the inherent inferiority and criminal nature of those who were Africans. Anytime any person of African descent was arrested for any type of offense, no matter what it was, they would exploit it and they would feed it to friendly journalists to make sure that it was published and got prominent play. Anytime a crime was committed by someone who was black, it was featured prominently in the media. Of course, we don't have that sort of thing now. <laughs> And what also happened is that with the assistance of sympathetic law enforcement, they also began a process of arrest, which was calculated to fill the prisons and the jails with people who were black. And so what can happen typically is that someone who risked life and limb to run away from the plantation finally finds him or herself in a northern city. They've been there for less than a day or two, and they're trying to find their bearings. They're trying to get established. Law enforcement happens upon them and says, who are you and where do you live? Well, sir, I'm just, uh, my, my name is, is Isaiah, and I'm in the process of trying to find myself gainful employment and a place to live. Is that right, Isaiah? That sounds to me like you're a vagrant. You're under arrest. So if, if on some other occasion, two people happen to be uh, out on a Saturday night, 
Maybe they drink a little bit too much. Maybe they start shoving each other. This isn't something that police walk in and just break up and say, hey, you go that way, you go that way. They're arrested. On the most serious and frivolous charges, people of African descent were being arrested wholesale. And if you look at the incarceration rates during that period, you see that they were through the roof. And the American Colonization Society ate this up like candy and made sure that the entire country knew about what was happening. Meanwhile, back in the South, as abolition was taking hold and slavery in its technical and formal sense was coming to an end, plantation owners found themselves with a continuing need for free labor. And with Africans who had been enslaved looking for other opportunities, trying to reunite with families, trying to move out of a place which had meant terror for them, they found themselves with a labor shortage. And thus be began the conditions which led to the establishment of what we've come to know as the convict lease system. Convict lease system was a process by which usually local sheriffs would take those that they were holding in jail and they would rent them out to plantation owners to provide labor. So this worked out very well. This worked out well for the plantation owners because they had essentially slave labor once again, and it worked out very well for the sheriffs because they were able to get extra income. And in order to increase their profits, naturally, they had an incentive to go out and to arrest as many people as they could in order to make sure that they had laborers that they could lease out. And so this continued the state of slavery for many, many, many years beyond formal abolition. You know, as there began the great migration of the Africans who had been formerly enslaved from the south to the north, you know, there were streams of travel, you know, from one part of the south, they would head along the east coast and end up on the eastern seaboard. Others ended up in this region, you know, usually from, uh, you know, states that were directly below this one. What began to happen was concentrations of people who lived in particular areas which at some point became known as ghettos. We call it the hood now, right? But these people became a focal point of concern for law enforcement because there was an ever-growing and a continuing belief that these were pockets of unrest and potential rebellion. And so there was a need to keep these people under control. And so these areas were always closely monitored, carefully patrolled, and they were where many arrests were made. You know, many times the, uh, the justification and the rational, rationale for having a police department depends upon arrest rates. You have to make it, you have to demonstrate evidence that there's a need for you. And if you're going to arrest lots of people, you're not going to do it among, in the neighborhoods or in the communities of those who are powerful and who make decisions about whether your law enforcement agency is funded or not funded, whether it exists or whether it doesn't exist. You're going to pursue the path of least resistance. You're going to attack the poor and the powerless and those of the people of color, which is what they have done historically. That's where people have been arrested. Even up to today, and I've had uh, conversations with police administrators that go along these lines. You know, you happen to send a lot of police into communities of color to patrol them. Is there a reason that you do that? Yes, there is. Why is it? Well, that's where the crime is. Yeah. Well, if, how, if you send most of your officers in there, how do you know that there's not crime in other communities? Well, because there are no arrests there. <laughs> if you don't send anybody into those communities, nobody's going to get arrested. That's right. Well, why do you just send them into communities of color? Well, that's where the crime is. We could do this all day, you know, but, and, and, and not get anywhere, but it, it, it explains a mentality, you know, something that exists within the law enforcement community, which is hard to shake. You know, the problems and the friction and the tension which exist as between particularly communities of African descent and the police is one which has escalated and has continued to get worse and worse as the years have gone by. And it has manifested itself many times in what we've seen 
so much of so recently with respect to violence which is directed against these people with no justification whatsoever. And as bad as things are now, there have been places in the United States which were even worse than what we've seen. You know, in the 1960s in Oakland, California, Oakland essentially had no police department. Oh, it had people who wore uniforms and badges and carried guns, but they were not there to protect and serve. What happened in Oakland, California in the 1960s was that these people would patrol black communities and on a nightly basis, almost as though it were sport, they would beat people to a pulp. They would attack them, they would kill them. I mean, it, it, was, it was a brutal kind of an existence that between a relationship between this so-called police department and black communities in Oakland, California. Fortunately for Oakland, and fortunately for those of us who struggle, we had within the ranks of the youth in Oakland geniuses. Huey P. Newton, Bobby Seale, took stock of what was happening there and they said, look, you know, we've got nobody to protect us from them, and so we have to establish someone who's going to stand between the police and the community. And thus was born the Black Panther Party for self-defense. You know, if you don't study your history, if you don't really understand what the Black Panther Party was all about, you think that this was some street gang that was just uh, out carrying weapons for the sake of it, you know, just to try and strike fear in the hearts of people. I mean, I'm not sure how much fun that is, but that's what people think many times. But these were people, these were committed young people, as young as 16 years old, who on a nightly basis would walk along behind the police with their rifles, patrolling and policing the police to make sure that they would not impose terror on members of their community. I mean, not only was this brilliant, but it demonstrates raw courage. I mean, and, and we have to appreciate that. And, and, and you know, it, it just doesn't stop there. I mean, they were prepared not only to patrol the police and to, if necessary, kill the police in order to protect their community. They also recognized the needs of their community and they began to put in place a social service network, which really was the prototype many of the social service agencies that we see now, the nonprofits and the public agencies that we see providing all kinds of services to the community, whether it's res with respect to health care, child care, uh, medical em med emergency medical transportation, education, all of these things the Black Panther Party put into place. And remarkably, remarkably law enforcement, and it's at that time modern, J. Edgar Hoover, looked at this, this group of committed, brilliant, beautiful, young black people who were serving the community, protecting the community, and he declared them the greatest threat to security in the United States of America. And he began a full-scale war against the Black Panther Party. The counterintelligence program, known as COINTELPRO, was something that was established specifically for the purpose of dealing with groups like this, and it went all out against the Black Panther Party, doing everything. You know, illegal break-ins and mail openings, of course. But it went so far as to engage in outright assassination, and certainly harassment, and jailings and frame-ups. There are some people who were members of the Black Panther Party who went to jail back in the 1960s, and don't you know, they're still in prison to this very day. And their only crime, their only crime was trying to make the community a better place. But this was regarded as a threat. Law enforcement regarded this as a threat. And it had to be destroyed. So we must understand that this continuing demonization, particularly of black youth, is one which has taken a firm grip on the consciousness of America. And so, in the minds of many, notwithstanding what the actual facts show with respect to criminal offenses and who's committing crimes and how they're committed and where they're committed, the face of crime for most people in America is very black. You say criminal, immediately the image pops into most people's heads of a young black thug. I mean, we see it in the media all the time. And you know, the fact is that sometimes the criminal, the, the rates of crime, 
and black communities has declined, you know. I mean, there, there are increasing numbers of black youth who are committed to going to college, and they're going. I mean, they're doing all kinds of productive things with their lives. And, you know, in the face of this, what they do is, well, there's not enough real black criminals, so let's create some. And so they come up with these hip-hop artists that they portray and feature in all of these videos that they run incessantly, you know, portraying them as thugs and as violent and all of these kinds of things to keep this image alive. Now, the, the tragedy of all of this is not just in the impact on the black community, but sometimes it's on the impact of well-meaning police officers themselves. Because the fact is, many of them have bought into a lot of this. <coughs> they make certain presumptions about the tendencies and the behavior of black youth, and they act on them. Not long ago, I was in a meeting with a number of uh, law enforcement people, you know, both officers on the street and administrators. And we were talking about this topic that we're here to discuss at this meeting. And one of the white officers raised his hands and he says, you know, every time I'm in a meeting with you, you're always bringing up the issue of race. I mean, you're always bringing up the issue of race. I said, oh, I said, you know, my job is racial justice in terms of <laughs> That's what I do. And he says, yes, but you keep bringing it up, and many of us are not racist. I'm not a racist. I don't go about my job doing racial things. I don't have racial thoughts. My job is to go out there and to enforce the law, and that's all that I do. And I said, yes, you do. And I said, after the meeting, I'd like to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. After the meeting, he approached me, you know, much to his credit. And so he says, you know, I just, I didn't want to, you know, make a big deal of it in the meeting, but, you know, you always bring up this race thing. And I said, yes, I do. I, he, he says, well, why? He says, I don't have racial thoughts. I said, you probably don't, at least not that you are aware of. However, <laughs> I challenge you to dispute what I'm about to say. I said, when you are assigned to patrol a community in an, ups, an upscale, uh, suburban, predominantly white neighborhood, right, and you stop someone for a traffic infraction, doesn't it go something like this? Whoa, hold up, hold up. You know, where's the fire? All right, you're going a little fast there. May I see your license and registration, please? Thank you. Oh, you live over on Murphy Street. Do you, do you know the Williams family? Yes, you know, I used to cut grass for them back when I was a teenager. I haven't seen them in years. Uh, well, when you see them, will you tell them Officer Smith said, oh, I, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, look, you know, I'm going to have to write you a citation. You're going a little bit fast there. Uh, why don't you take this, and I want you to, you know, take care of it. And from now on, let's go a little easy on that accelerator, all right? Okay, you have a nice day. He says, yeah. I said, all right. Now, when you're assigned to patrol in Detroit, doesn't it go like this? You pull up on the car, you and your partner jump out with your weapons drawn, you call for backup, they roll up and they pull out their weapons, you approach the car, you open it, open, you jerk open the door, you jerk the people out of the car, you throw them down on the ground face down, you start screaming obscenities and profanity at them, you put their arms, their hands behind their back and you cuff them, and you threaten them with all kinds of violence, screaming at them before you've asked or found out anything about them. And he says, well, I'm a little embarrassed, but yes, that's exactly what happens. And he says, but I'm not racist. I'm not doing that for racial reasons. And I said, well, maybe you are, maybe you aren't, but you do it. He says, yes. He says, but the reason that I do it and the reason that most police do it is because we know that when we're patrolling in Detroit that it's a dangerous place. And our job, our commitment is to go home at the end of our ship in one piece alive to our families. And what we want to do is from the outset establish our authority with these people that we stop to make sure that they know that they should at no point try and, and, and challenge us violently or in any other way. That we're in control, that we are the authorities, and that we are the ones who are going to control that situation. And I said, yes, that may be your objective, but the effect is this. I said, the people that you're afraid of in Detroit know you. I said, they watch you. They know where you are at all times, and they make sure that they're never in the same place that you are. Which means that the people that you stop are people who are just getting off the second shift on the loading dock, who are tired, trying to just, just get home. You're stopping 
a dad who's trying to get across town to pick up his daughter from Cass Tech after band practice. You're stopping a young man who's trying to go across town to pick up Big Mama to take her to her medical appointment. You're stopping somebody who is just trying to get to his third job and he's dog tired. And when you stop them and you treat them that way, it makes an impression on them. They share that story with their friends and their relatives, and you create all kinds of tension and friction within that community that need not exist between the police and civilians. Right on. Which means that the next time you stop somebody else who knows the experience that you put somebody else through, it's already going to be tense. And you increase the danger to yourself. Because in order to protect themselves because of fears of you, they may react in ways that they don't need to react. And so he says, when well, I never thought about that, he says, could you come and talk to me and some of my colleagues about this? I said, anytime. <laughs> so we must understand <laughs> that much of what exists as barriers to cooperation and understanding between police and the community has much to do with a lot of history. It has a lot to do with institutional factors. It has a lot to do with ignorance, a lack of analysis, and a lack of commitment to try to resolve the problem. And what we can do is we can try and identify some of the more, more prominent features of the problem. One of them we just discussed in terms of the demeanor of police officers and how they conduct themselves when they come into contact with communities of color. You know, they need not occupy these communities as though they're an invading, occupying army. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they're serious, if they really want to do their job, they will come in as neighbors. And it's even better if the police department is made up of people who are neighbors. The other aspect of this has much to do with police culture. You know, the way that police think. You know, what they think of themselves and what their relationship is to other people. And for many, far too many police officers, and they're trained this way by their, their, their colleagues, maybe, maybe not in the academy, but they're trained. I mean, there's a mentality of it's us against the world. Oh, yeah. You know, let's, if, you know, blue bonds together and it's us because everybody's out to try and get us. You know, maybe we got a dangerous job and we gotta make sure we got each other's back. All right, every time we step out on the street, there's danger there and we gotta make sure that we are, you know, I mean, that kind of a siege mentality can create itchy tr trigger fingers if you're not careful. And so that aspect of police culture is one which is fraught with danger. Police are trained. Many times when they pull out their gun, then it's serious business. And if you pull that trigger, you better shoot to kill. There is no half step there. Okay, If you have gotten to the point where it's necessary for you to pull that weapon, then you better use it and make sure that when the smoke clears, you're the one that's left standing. And there are places where people are instructed to empty their guns. All right, so that once you shoot once, you don't stop shooting until you've emptied that weapon. This can have tragic consequences. If you've not heard of a man named Milton Hall, I urge with caution that you check him out on the internet. Milton Hall was a 49-year-old, mentally ill, homeless black man who lived in Saginaw. Milton Hall, at one time, you know, in his youth was a civil rights activist, been trained by Rosa Parks. You know, but mental illness set in and he, he had many personal demons and problems that he had to deal with. But on one particular day, about two and a half to three years ago, he was in an establishment and he had an argument with the cashier. He left, the police were called. Police officers arrived. They had a conversation with him for a number of minutes, 18 to 20. And at one point, things started to go bad. They surrounded him in, a, in, in, a, in an almost semicircle, and a canine uh, was brought in on a leash. 
The officer with the canine loosened the leash, and the dog approached Milton Hall and was snapping and barking at him. Mr. Hall began to yell at the dog and to yell at the police, saying that he wasn't afraid of the dog. He pulled out a knife and he started waving it in the dog's direction, saying, let the dog go, let him come, let him come. And when he pulled out that knife, these officers no more. raised their rifles and they emptied their guns. More than 40 shots aimed at this man who went down and even as he was on the ground, they continued to shoot bullets into his body. Now, I am not just basing this on secondhand accounts. Fortunately for us, the dashboard camera for one of the police cars captured the entire thing. And I said it's not something that I take, I, that I cavalierly urge anyone to watch, you know, to watch the death of someone. But if anyone has any doubts about the potential for brutality of police officers, this is something to see. And it's available on the internet, okay? The ACLU of Michigan took this case to the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights for reasons which I'm about to explain. The Saginaw County prosecutor had uh, access to this video. He watched it. He interviewed everybody who was involved. And after his so-called investigation, he came back and concluded that uh, criminal charges were not warranted. Because uh, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, he thought that the, uh, the dog's life was in danger and uh, it was necessary to protect the dog and possibly the other officers from this pocket knife that uh, Milton Hall carried. At the time that this was announced, the U.S. Department of Justice had also announced that it was going to engage in an investigation and they conducted one which lasted more than a year. I mean, we contributed to it. We knew about other things that were going on in Saginaw that we thought that they should look into that were related to police irregularities. And we, you know, had some hopes that uh, if the Department of Justice would live up to its name, that it would bring some semblance of justice to this situation. And at the end of their investigation, they announced that they did not see sufficient evidence for them that would warrant bringing federal criminal civil rights charges against these officers. Saying essentially that in order for them to make their case, it would be necessary for them to know that it was the intent of the police officers to purposely you know, deprive this man of his civil rights. In my book, if you shoot 46, 47 bullets at somebody, you're trying to deprive him of his life. Don't shoot. So, you know, this, this, this was something which creates real concerns for us about the response of the federal government to these crimes because it leaves us in many respects in the same situation as Huey Newton and Bobby Seale back in the 1960s in Oakland. You got nobody to turn to to protect the community. And what's the community to do? The police aren't going to protect them. The county prosecutor isn't going to protect them. U.S. Department of Justice is not going to protect him. Who protects the people? So this becomes something of great concern, and it stems from this culture, this police cultural, uh, you know, tendency to want to empty your gun when you shoot. And certainly, there are racial stereotypes which feed into a lot of this, and which are very much a part of police culture many times where there are, you know, in addition to just general racial profiling, certain presumptions that are made about people uh, based on how they dress, where they live, what they do, that kind of thing, which uh, leads to encounters between police and civilians that uh, sometimes are unnecessary and sometimes unnecessarily uh, not civil. The other thing that is really critical, at least in my view, is the whole question of accountability. In light of everything that we've seen in recent months, Milton Hall in particular, where police officers commit some of the worst crimes and charges are not brought against them, that in and of itself sends a message, a powerful message to police. Now we don't know for sure how many are impacted by that or to what extent they are, but it's easy for a police officer to believe 
that in America, if you have a gun and a badge, you can do pretty much anything you want against black people, and you'll never be held to account for it, never. And, and you know, in, in the wake of the Milton Hall killing, you know, we were told by the Department of Justice, well, look, you know, don't worry, don't worry. You know, even if criminal charges aren't brought against these officers, the family still has an opportunity to file a civil lawsuit against them. And they can get justice that way. No, they can't get justice that way. Because what happens when you file a civil lawsuit against a police officer, even if you win, even if you get a settlement or a verdict that's in six or seven figures, the police officer who committed the crime never has to worry about it, not one moment. Because those damages are paid from the government's treasury. You pay for their crimes with your tax dollars. So when you read, you know, say, oh, look at this, you know, this victim of police brutality got a settlement in the amount of $600,000, good for him. No! <laughs> that came from you. You paid that. And the police officer who did it walks cavalierly along knowing that he's never held to account for anything. So this places police officers in the position of never having to contemplate consequences. If you or I think that maybe what we need to do, because we're a little short on cash, maybe we go in here and stick up this gas station, you know, get some money out of the cash register. Well, you know, we got to think about, well, if we do that, then, you know, we're going to be charged with armed robbery, and that's going to mean next number of years in prison. Nah, maybe I won't do that. <laughs> Police officer thinks, hey, there's a couple of young dudes over there, you know, black guys, probably up to no good. Let me go over here and bash their heads around a little bit. Maybe I'll find some dope on them. He never has to think, you know, I might go to jail for that. Maybe I won't do it. <laughs> it would be nice to have police officers in that situation where they gotta contemplate the consequences mm -hmm. of their actions. Yep. And so yep. it becomes a real issue. The whole question of psychological screening is something that can be very important for police. Because there are a lot of people walking around with badges and guns who really should not have badges and guns. I mean, just go visit Inkster and ask people about that. And then finally, you know, we, we have to uh, think about the, the general politics of policing. Because a lot of this is very political. I mean, it, it, it goes beyond just what happens in America. I mean, and I'm talking for myself now, not the ACLU, all right? Okay? You know, what it all comes down to in, in this, in, on this planet is who's got the wealth and who doesn't. And if you got the wealth, you want to protect it by whatever means. And there are certain populations on this planet that uh, you regard as a threat to that wealth. And so you've got to make sure that they're always controlled. And, uh, you know, for a lot of reasons, you know, communities of color in this country are regarded as a continuing threat, you know, to the control of wealth. But it's not just here. You know, you go around the world and you find, you know, populations which are rising up. You know, they want, they want their resources. They want their oil. They want their mineral mines. You know, they want access to their timber. They want access to the natural wealth of their country and they want to threaten the access to that by doing what they got to do, even if it means taking up arms. And so those with wealth, those with power, look at these people and they say that they need to be controlled. And so our country, our government, does all kinds of things in order to control these populations. Sometimes we don't even know about it. You know, yeah. the military is not allowed to provide instructions to, uh, to civilian police in other countries, but the State Department can. And they've got a program that, uh, that they instruct you know, police officers in a number of different countries, many of them in Africa and Asia, about how to control populations under the purported basis of controlling terrorism or fighting terrorism. And so they've instructed many police departments about how to control these populations. And sometimes it's through the use of military means. Right. And so if they're going to militarize police overseas, what makes you think that they're not going to militarize police here in America? And just look at the response to uprisings in Ferguson and you will see dramatically what we're talking about. Right? So these are all 
heart of the problem. These are some of the issues, and I think it falls to us to begin to systematically address them, to figure out effective strategies of dealing with them, analyzing them, and ultimately uh, taking care of them in a way that's going to result in a resolution of the problems that have been caused by the police for communities. And whether they know it or not, it's going to eliminate many of what the police regard as problems with the community. Thank you very much.